In Arcana number 6, we encountered a human mind suspended in indecision, much like how this channel has been suspended in the indecisiveness of this author's personal lifestyle for the past couple of months. <coughs> now in Arcana 7, the chariot, we finally get moving again. No, literally. The image on this card here is a carriage in motion, or at least ready to depart. Drawn by two animals, usually horses or lions, this carriage is piloted by a brave young person who sits steadfast on the vehicle, triumphantly progressing on forward. Unlike most of the cards we've talked about so far, the topic of anima and animus, again human femininity and masculinity, isn't as important to this card, since it is the first of several major arcana that deal with a recurring theme of these cards the uniting and channeling of opposite forces into a single stream of energy. An aspect of the image on this card that's so important that pretty much every single interpretation of the card that I've read mentions it is the fact that the man riding the chariot does not in fact hold reins or any other physical means of steering the chariot the way it is supposed to go. Actually, on many illustrations the two beasts drawing the chariot even seem to be headed in opposite directions. The traditional interpretation of this iconography is that the person on the chariot has to direct the animals using nothing but his sheer willpower and determination to do so. In a way, the card can be seen as a continuation of the themes of the lover's arcana. Before, our protagonist was faced with two choices, represented in two opposing principles, vying for their attention. Now that they've made their choice, they have to stand by it, steadfast and valiant, and direct the opposing forces represented in the two animals drawing the chariot towards their goal. When I think of a theme for this card, the first thing that comes to me is the term ambition. The person pictured on this card is a hero, most likely a self-proclaimed one, triumphantly riding into battle or returning from it, not fearing what lies ahead, armed first and foremost with indomitable willpower. They know exactly where they want to go and what they want to do there, because they've already made the choice long before ever boarding the chariot. However, at the same time, riding a chariot without any wings to control the animals and standing on it upright like the protagonist on our card does is obviously a pretty dangerous thing to do. I won't mince words here. As much as this card stands for ambition and determination, it also stands for foolhardiness. A person who rushes headfirst into combat the way our charioteer does can easily be in for a lot of trouble if they fail to keep a cool head. They could end up falling off their literal high horse and land flat on their face. Or worse, ride straight into certain doom. The chariot is a very important part of the journey of individuation, since its archetype stands for the determination and willpower needed to take action and move forward towards the actual goal of the journey. However, this is also a very dangerous archetype if the person it is applied to lacks self-discipline. When you're riding headfirst into battle at maximum speed, it's easy to lose your way or control over the carriage and derail horribly. It's this balance act between willpower and control that the Persona series usually uses the card to represent. Now, even without me explaining, you can probably already see how this theme relates to our, um, offenders in the Persona universe, right? Masao, Mark, Inaba, Aigis, Kazushi Miyamoto, Ryo Iwasaki, Chie Satunaka, and yes, everyone's favorite Broran, Ryuji Sakamoto, are all wonderful examples of both the do's and don'ts of piloting your own personal battle chariot. I could just end the video right here actually, and you'd all still get the point. But that's not what you all waited for several months, right? Right. Alright. Then let's go into more detail. Persona 1's resident goofball and renowned, um, dancer, Mark, may be a giant meme. Very much so by choice, but underneath those smiles and choking demeanor, he hides an iron will that drives the plot of the game's main Sabak route often more so than the actual protagonist. It's through Mark that we learn a lot about Maki and her condition, and it's his powerful desire to protect her that the player is supposed to empathize with for a majority of the game, making it more than just somewhat likely that you're going to side with Mark when K suggests to... um... Cut Maki loose late into the story. You deserve that punch, Kay. Oh, yes. 
show it again. In a lot of ways, Masao seems like a precursor to his later successor, Ryuchi Sakamoto. He is a known troublemaker who rebels against authority out of choice. However, he is not unempathetic towards the plight of others. A scene when he's shown feeling bad when the police officers who arrested him just earlier are turned into zombies. Yeah, Persona 1 is a weird game like that. He's also got a deeply creative mind, and he is a talented street artist, something that comes up when infiltrating the Sabak base. And in later games, when we learn that he went abroad to study flying pop art. Everything in Mark's life has to do with rushing straight in and giving everything 110%. From his dedication to Maki, regardless of whether she can return his feelings for her or not, to his love for street art, despite not holding any ill will towards the police. There's also his powerful rivalries with Hidehiko and especially K, the latter of which is also relevant, since K, as a representative of the Hierophant Arcana, stands directly opposed to Max Chariot Arcana. The Hierophant is about standing in place for the sake of your own ideals, while the Chariot Arcana is about pushing forward for the same sake. So it's really no surprise that these two clash as much as they do. All aside from the fact that they're both just really, really stubborn. Oh yes, punch him again. <laughs> That's amazing. Skipping straight over Persona 2 and its distinct lack of Chariot Arcana representatives, we move on to Persona 3, which features a total of three representatives for this Arcana. Oh boy. Agus becomes far more relevant later during the Judgment and Ian Arcana. Needless to say, the Chariot Arcana is mostly relevant to her early in the game, before her character development fully kicks in, and is mostly connected to one central aspect of her character, her programming as a being originally based on an AI. As a soul born of a computer, Aegis was born with a specific directive to fight shadows and protect humans at all costs. Disregarding her own safety in the process, like the red shirt to end all red shirts. It should, however, not go unmentioned that fairly early in her history, this directive of Aegis's becomes slightly altered upon imprisoning the Death Arcana shadow within the soul and body of Makoto Yuki, upon which Aegis gains a new prime directive, which she retains despite her damaged memory. Protect Makoto no matter what and let no harm come to them. This priority of herself overrides whatever sense of self-preservation she might have had and even leads into Aegis almost getting herself killed. In case of the movie series, repeatedly so. This is the chariot Aegis rides on for most of her early life, ensuring Makoto Yuki's well-being. It's why her interaction with the protagonist is as important to her character development as it is, and why losing them in the end is so absolutely soul-crushing to her. It is enough to make her fully re-evaluate the meaning of her own life. But more about that when we get to the Judgment Arcana. I swear, we're getting there. I promise! Speaking of a dangerous lack of self-preservation... Kazushi. Oh, Kazushi. Kazushi is painful to watch. Everyone knows what he's doing wrong. Yuko knows what he's doing wrong. You know what he's doing wrong. Even he knows what he's doing wrong. But, but he I still does it. it. The treatment of his arc is as straightforward as it comes. He has a goal, winning the nationals of his spot of choice to motivate his five-year-old nephew to start rehab for his busted leg. There's a problem though. Kazushi overdoes it so much, she absolutely ruins his own leg in the process. Now anyone with half a brain would be able to tell you that winning the nationals in swimming, kendo, or freaking track is an absolute impossibility if you only have use of one of your legs. So his way of approaching his goal is self-defeating. Kazushi, however, he does it anyway. Riding his overdriven chariot right off a cliff, like, like the, the Leroy, Leroy Jenkins he is. I'm sorry. Sorry, it, it's just... Ugh. Kazushi frustrates me. Thankfully, Yuko and the protagonist do get him to come to his senses and slow down eventually. Still, his arc is a prime example of how the chariot's ambition can quite easily sabotage itself if not kept under tight control. Next up, we have another athlete, Ryo. Ryo is as straightforward a chariot as you can get. 
She wants to win and she wants to get better. So she takes training very seriously. She trains and trains, forgets to take everyone else's feelings into account and overdoes it to the point that the club stops being fun for everyone, including herself. All because she uses her excessive competitiveness as a way to compensate for her inability to gain the attention of Kenji, who she has a hopeless crush on. As soon as she admits her own feelings to herself, she is able to let up a bit on her strictness by focusing all of her attention on Kanji instead, which again causes her and everyone else distress. It is only when Leo finally decides to get her feelings for Kanji sorted out properly that she can focus on the club without overdoing it, but above all else with discipline and fun. Okay, so much for Persona 3. And, oh, talking about the Dio, here we are in Inaba, and our next subject has a cameo right here. Cheer. Ah, Chia, there's so much to say about her. In fact, one of my most well-liked Tumblr posts ever was about her. But let's keep it short and sweet, shall we? Chia Satonaka wants to be two things in life strong and feminine. Unfortunately, due to her small town upbringing, in her mind those two things are directly opposed, causing her to question herself. A lot. When she's being strong, she's worried about being unfeminine and a failure as a woman. When she's being feminine, she's worried about being weak and unable to protect the things she cares about. This conflict makes it difficult for her to control her emotional impulses, hence why she tends to rush into situations without thinking about them, even though it is often shown that despite all, she is actually very far from unintelligent and very intuitive and clever when she doesn't think too much about judging herself. The biggest issue her conflicting desires manifest into is her inferiority-superiority complex towards Yukiko, in which she at once sees Yukiko as an unreachable ideal to aspire towards, but also as a weak damsel to aid her in living out her power fantasies. It is through not only her social link, but also through seeing Adachi's self-destructive, defeatist behavior and finally meeting Akihiko that Chie realizes that by holding herself back and compromising on her own self-esteem, she is destroying her chance to ever actually achieve any of her goals. So in the end, she stops caring about whether or not her tomboyish interests are considered unfeminine and lives them out wholeheartedly, starting police training while also becoming more overall playful and feminine in her dress style. In Chia's case, it was a difficulty in controlling and guiding two seemingly opposed forces, her strength and her femininity, towards a common goal, which caused her distress and almost made her chariot ride end in disaster. It is only when she realizes that she was thinking in a false dichotomy and that the two metaphorical beasts drawing her carriage could easily be friends rather than enemies that she becomes fully comfortable with herself and following her own ambitions. And with this, dear friends, we have reached the moment most of you were probably waiting for. Here we are. Persona 5. Say hello to Yuji. <sighs> Talking about social links alone, he's probably one of the, if not the most reasonable person we're dealing here with. Yeah, yeah, I know, I'm also surprised. Unlike Kazushi, the injury to his lack that robbed him of his track career was almost entirely not his own fault. Instead, it was his failure to keep his impulses in check and wait for the right time and way to try and take action against Kamoshida's abuse of his team that caused him to end up in the position he is in. Doing his social link, uh, excuse me, I mean confidant, he acts very reasonable, wanting to get back into running now that his condition allows for it again, but also realizing that he can't expect things to go back to the way that they were before. In that way, Ryuji's link is dealing much more with getting a chariot that has already derailed back onto track than any of the other stories told here. Something that he, thanks to his calm, somewhat objective treatment of past events, actually manages to achieve. While he does not go back to the track team, he manages to help his former team members restore their club, a goal that has clearly been on his mind ever since the fateful incident. Now, in this way, one could think that Ryuji is probably the most level-headed chariot on this list, right? <laughs> no! Oh my god, no! As soon as we leave the realms of his confidant and instead focus on the main story, things go very, very off-grid. 
Out of all the members of the Phantom Thieves, Ryuji is definitely the one who gets carried away by their ambitious goals the fastest, gets caught up in wanting to constantly go bigger and better the most, and has the hardest time keeping his ego in check. This is probably why he can be so calm and reasonable when it comes to the track team. All of the guy's excess energy is directed straight at his activities with the other Phantom Thieves, in which he repeatedly rides his chariot right into a brick wall by making decisions that couldn't possibly have looked good even in his head, let alone on paper. His treatment of theft missions as a thrilling adventure, his repeated blotting out of sensitive information in public, his constant and sensitive bickering with my Morgana, which even causes the cat to leave the group for a while. Oh, but don't think Morgana is blameless in this thing. No, no, kitty, I am getting to you. And how could anyone forget this scene? <sighs> Honestly, I would point out an arc here, but Ryuji really doesn't change much in behavior over the course of the game. From beginning to end, he stays excitable, overly enthusiastic to cause a shakeup, and foolhardily to a fault. And let's be honest, that's what we love about him. Still, he really needs to keep the chariot of his in check a bit. I mean, if Mark, Chia and even Kasushi can get their own willpower under control, why shouldn't Ryuji be able to? And frankly, he probably will. After all, it is an important theme of the series. Control, not over the world around you, but over yourself. Being true to your own feelings and goals without destroying yourself or others in the process, but finding the best way to express yourself and fight for what you believe in. The safest and most efficient way to travel your own journey, whether that involves protecting an important person, winning at sports without ruining your interpersonal relationships, or, or your knee, or repeatedly saving all of humanity from manifestations of their own vices. The chariot is the metaphor for how we need to approach our ambitions. Steadily, with our eyes on the prize. Don't go too fast, don't go off the rails. Stay determined and keep control over your own determination. That's how I too will eventually be able to upload YouTube videos in a less than six months interval. Probably. Hey everyone, it's been a while, but I'm back and kicking. If you like what you saw, check out the links on screen and in the description to find some more of my stuff as well as ways to support me. Well then, see ya!